Hello, and welcome back to Movie Husbands. Today we'll be reviewing Bo is Afraid. Directed by Ari Aster, Bo is Afraid stars Joaquin Phoenix as the title character, a mild-mannered but paranoia-ridden man who embarks on a surreal odyssey to get home to his mother, confronting his greatest fears along the way. So just in case you're new to our reviews, we tend to go pretty in-depth about what we think the film is about, so we may end up spoiling some parts of the film, so I'd recommend seeing the film first and then maybe checking out this review afterwards. So Matt, what did you think of Bo is Afraid? So I want to back up just slightly to start with Ari Aster because he is a director that I haven't been really familiar with until you had me watch Hereditary very recently. If you've watched our channel before, you know I am not a big fan of horror movies. And so Hereditary was just not on my radar. It was grappling with a lot of cool concepts, like a lot about the family dynamics and trauma. I felt like the third act just ultimately faltered with those themes and abandoned them for too much of an explanation of why these paranormal type things were happening in the house to begin with. I agree with you, by the way, not that we're reviewing Hereditary, yeah. <laughs> but just in case someone's curious, I always thought that film was extremely well directed and very well crafted and really loses itself in the last half hour, unfortunately. Yeah, I agree with that. But the reason I point that out is because I think Bo is Afraid, unfortunately, suffers from a little bit of the same fate but in a little bit of a different way. And we will get to that a little bit in the review as we go forward, because I have a lot that I do want to talk about. With that said, I do want to point out though, that with Hereditary, my experience watching that film and with Bo is Afraid, I really do think Ari Aster has a knack for developing these really cool visual tones that I don't get to see a lot in film. I can mostly attribute that to his marriage between cinematography and production design. I think he spends a lot of time focusing on these things and also how the camera moves through these sequences and these scenes in a very unique stylistic way. I think permeates itself a lot in this movie and particularly the production design is absolutely insane. There's so many details in this movie that you are blinking and miss it because there's so much baked into it that just like there's graffiti like lining the walls. I was gonna say some of the funniest punchlines are actually in the background of the movie. <laughs> there was a lot of like little posters that I was reading that just had the funniest thing on them. So much of that just influenced I think uh, Joaquin Phoenix's, I'm sorry I'm forgetting the character's name. Uh, Bo? Oh, Bo. Oh, my God. <laughs> the character's name is Bo. Make sure you leave that in. No, no. I, that's embarrassing. I can't leave that in. And like the way I described uh, sort of this littering of all these metaphorical things in the background of the screen, I think ultimately the film kind of succumbs to those things in a way. Almost like the metaphors, there's too many of them in the film that the film loses its grasp on character and the story itself. So I think that by the end, unfortunately, just like how I ended up feeling about Hereditary, I think in the third act, all of it just seems to lose its weight and its themes because I think so much focus was put on these metaphors and all these details that the film almost plays too stylistic to me to have any real impact. Yeah, I've said actually since Midsommar that I really want to see Ari Aster direct someone else's scripts because <laughs> I just, I don't think he's much of a writer. He's very beloved, but I think that as a director, he's quite good. He's actually has a really unique style that, and he's a true auteur in a way that we don't have a whole lot of those, especially from America nowadays. I love when something is a very tightly wound metaphor that's supposed to mean something really deep in your soul that you get and you say, okay, this symbolizes this and this symbolizes this. That's such a brilliant way to portray this thing that I had in my soul this whole time. I think with Bo is Afraid, and we haven't mentioned the runtime of three hours, <laughs> it's that the metaphors continually are so simplified and keep meaning the same things throughout, even though it has all these great stylistic flourishes, including animation and all these other things that happen, I just ended up saying, okay, so we're still going for that. Mm, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, it became so needlessly repetitive to me, so tautological in structure that I became quite bored, I would say after the first hour. I actually think the, the first hour is pretty good. But when we first meet Bo, he's in this, really lawless world where there's just naked serial killers running around, people lighting themselves on fire. And it really epitomizes this idea of not even necessarily agoraphobia, but just living in the modern world where you could encounter violence at any time. If you're somebody who has anxiety and watches the news, these are all things that you're maybe thinking about when you're walking to the convenience store. And Bo is certainly thinking about th those things when he has to walk to the convenience store just to get a bottle of water. So I thought all of that was actually really funny. It's from then onward that the film starts to lose me bit by bit, and it didn't lose me all at once, but it was just a gradual decrease in my interest. One of the things that I was noticing during this film that I was trying to pick out the reality, because it seemed like everything was a little bit too blown over proportions, 
that I had a hard time feeling like it was saying something about society, like the concept of going out and feeling like something to happen to you at any moment. I think those feelings exist, but I think that they're so extravagantly focused on and blown out of proportion in this film that it almost made me constantly search for what I thought was reality in Bo's world and his character. When we walked out of this film, I called it a poor man's synecdoche New York. And that's a film that builds its world and is quite full of surrealism and a bunch of things that could never happen, but they all feel uniquely part of the world that was built, which I don't think this film ever really achieves. Interesting point to make because I saw this film differently and it was towards the middle of the film where Bo has this weird experience in the woods where he goes through like almost an animated featurette of different experiences in his life. Like all of a sudden his kids have lost him along the way and then they find him and they have this weird heartwarming moment. The kids are like, you remember us. Mm -hmm. And so at this moment, I had this click in my head and I was like, what if so much of this world of what we're seeing isn't reality, but is built of a reality within Bo's head? To me, I was thinking like, maybe it's schizophrenia. And this whole film is a trip. I know this is gonna seem weird, but I have a lot of detail to back this I up. Don't, I actually don't think it's weird. I just think that it's perhaps focusing too much on what happened and not why it happens. I know, that's why I think is a fault of the film is because I think it, it places all this without maybe saying that, but I don't know if necessarily the film is about that. Well, here's the funny thing. If you're coming from the what and I'm coming from the why, neither one of us liked the film, so <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work on either level. But what I'm gonna say is that when that moment hit me and I thought, oh, maybe Bo has like a very severe case of schizophrenia, the rest of the film made more sense to me. Delusions and the fantasy and taking real things that are happening in the world and placing them in his brain. When he's at his house, his apartment, and he has to go across the street and all these crazy people, seemingly this one street just has insane crazy people that are constantly around in a big group. I'm thinking he's not really in a street in the city. I think he's in a mental institution and I think he's surrounded by people who are just as crazy as he is and he's afraid of them because of his schizophrenia. All of a sudden he disappears from the city after he gets stabbed. Where does he end up? In the suburbs. It's very strange. And all of a sudden he comes across two people that have more like authority figures. I think that connection draws to his actual mother who we don't see yet at this point in the film. And like how the mom whispers in his ear very briefly, like not to incriminate him. And then he sees like the camera filming him. Like all these things could literally be taking place in either a mental institution or towards the end, I think maybe a jail. And he is visually changing these things in his head because of his schizophrenia. I think the whole film makes more sense when you think about it from this way. Well, then the film is really bad. <laughs> um, I, I really- I, I actually made me like it more when I thought about that, but I, very, I don't have any clarification. I, I don't know I, if that's I, true. I very fiercely disagree with that take actually, yeah. because I just, I don't think it's the type of film that's giving you all these littering of puzzle pieces for you to put it together towards the end and say, hey, this is the answer. You know, I just don't think it's that way. I don't think it's the sixth sense. That actually disagrees with why I dislike the film in some sense is because I felt like it failed at building a surrealist world. All right, let's move on from that because I do want to talk briefly about Joaquin Phoenix because he does play the titular character of Bo in this film. And he is really great in this film. There isn't a movie that I haven't seen him in that I have not liked. I think he has a great acting ability and a way of bringing out these emotions in this character between paranoia, and sadness of like grief. And he, he really balances all these emotional tones and flips them on a dime so quickly. I think he's pretty good. I mean, I, I'm, he's certainly not bad. He's definitely in a more restrained register, I would say, than a lot of films, especially he's coming off of Joker and Joker's at a very high register. He's yelling all the time. Joker is a movie that I think would have the schizophrenia angle, perhaps. That's a film of like really lowbrow quality, in my opinion, that would like throw something like that in at the end. Okay, we have to talk about this because I don't think that would make it lowbrow at all. I think it actually makes the movie quite sad. But like where, where's the evidence of this aside from just the fact that he's having surrealism? Like we're basically working with the metaphors that in some way you could say is his anxiety or his representation of culture, his representation of family, and instead like putting them into the what context of being in like a psychiatric hospital. I think it's because all those things still can be true. Once you like find the truthful things in there, his character ends up quite feeling quite sad. Like his relationship with his mother, it was very poor. 
She was very overbearing and cold. Shout out to Patty Lapone in this film. She did a wonderful job towards the end of the movie, I believe, in building just like that chilly coldness of what she was like as a mother. It's not that they're answers, but they're more layering realities within the surrealism. I guess if just if the film wanted us to think that way, it would give us some indication beyond Maybe. its surrealism. I saw an interview with Ari Aster where Nathan Fielder asked him about the end of the film and he was like, oh, I just really wanted it to represent an ejaculation. I was like, oh God. It was oh wait, was that really it? Okay, this can't be about schizophrenia then. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm putting too much credit on what this movie is. If I'm trying to look at it from, you know, a media literacy standpoint, I'm just trying to think of the signals that the film would give me in order for me to yeah. like insert that into it. Yeah. And I just, yeah, I'm not seeing it. I mean, Bo's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm like, there's obviously <laughs> something mentally going on. A lot of the metaphors and a lot of his, his anxieties that he has in the film are anxieties that everybody has. We're just seeing them on this great proportional divide. Yeah, maybe I'm just going too far in explaining the movies, but I think that may be a fault of the way that in which I view film is that I do look for explanations mm -hmm. or just reasons for why things happen. You're like a that's what? Yeah, you're life. a what happened person yeah. sometimes. <laughs> and yeah, and I'm, I'm very rarely a what happened person, but that's why I'm kind of enjoying this discussion. And I think that coming at the film from these angles, I never would have even thought of that. You know, to me, and sometimes I'm kind of blind to this, I have to admit, is that I, I, I don't know what the what is in this film. I don't know if there is a what. We talked about the end of the film briefly. And the reason I want to actually highlight it is because it's one of the metaphors, potential metaphors in the film that I actually like a little bit. Because I can almost see it as being a metaphor for those thoughts that you have in the shower or you maybe have falling asleep at night where... The prosecution is just saying all of these things in your head of every moment of guilt you've ever had and all of the embarrassing things you've ever done. And the prosecution is so loud and the defense is so far away, it can barely be heard. The defense is those thoughts in your head that says, you're really not this way, it's your reassurance. And there's a crowd of people there to witness all of this embarrassment. I thought that was kind of interesting. The last five minutes of the movie is so small in comparison to everything that preceded it that it just did not save the movie for me in any regard. I actually feel really disappointed on a different level that I didn't like this because I don't want to root for this film's failure in any way. You know, this film has a $35 million budget. Not a huge budget, but for Ari Aster, that's a pretty large budget. And it did a lot with that budget. It actually looks quite a bit more expensive than it is. And I really want studios to take risks with filmmakers and auteurs who are very talented and, and give them money and give them vision to be able to do these things. And I just wish that I like this film more. In many ways, it's actually, perhaps I'm being harder on it because it's doing so many things that I typically like in films. It's using metaphor, it's using surrealism, it's about um, mental health and anxiety and all of those things, except it's just not diving very deep. And for, frankly, the toll of its runtime, it just doesn't feel like you have very much to hold on to when it ends, unfortunately, at least for me. So you're ready to go to grades? Yeah, I'm gonna give this a C. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> continue. I, I don't know, I just, I feel bad. I like Ari Aster, I like A24. I like when independent filmmakers graduate to making larger films that take a lot of risks. I think this film really does take a lot of risks. It just, just wasn't there for me. You know, I know, I know it's a divisive film. There are many people that agree with me. There are also many people that like, this is their favorite movie of the year. You know, I applaud those people. I hope that people enjoy this film and I really want Ari Aster to continue making, you know, genre bending work. I didn't love it, I didn't hate it, but I give Bo's Afraid a B. I oh, wow. That's way higher than I thought. I think that might be a little bit surprising, but as I reflect on the movie, and you know what? I'm sticking with this freaking schizophrenia thing, even though we had the multiple conversations about it. You know, there's just too many details. How the brothers in that flashback come in and they're talking to him and they're like, oh, he remembers us today. Sorry, not the brothers, the sons. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking the sons are reality and they're coming to visit him and that's one of the days in which he recognizes them and remembers who they are because it's a very poignant moment where he seems like he's present from all the noise. I do agree with you that that moment is really odd. It's almost like the layering of his past as well. So it's like the layering of certain things that he's either anxious about or layerings of memories that are put over one another and influenced in the production design of the scenes. I was uh, criticizing Thomas Pynchon once and um, I said how his his books were so intentionally confusing that it was like, it confounded me on a level that I didn't think that anything really good can come from it. And that was a college perspective. I'm not saying that's my, my perspective now, but somebody's justification for this was like, well, isn't life confusing? <laughs> and I, I just thought that was like really poor th 
thoughtmanship. Are you trying to say I have poor thoughtmanship with this? No, I no, no. Made a, a viable case there. No, oh yeah, I know. I just I don't I don't view film through through that lens. But then I again, get. I lost my interest when you said the whole interview with the penis bit. I'm just like, well, okay, if that's all he thinks about it. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe he's in the psych ward and he has no place to jerk off, and that's why he has like these gigantic balls. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, this movie is basically about balls. <laughs> I didn't get to mention this, but um, Ari Aster's student films and short films are of this like real shockwave kind of juvenile mentality that I think he returns to here, and I just don't think it's very fitting. In a way that I didn't really care for either. I thought it to be a little bit juvenile. Yeah, I found it like a little South Parky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the point that the giant penis shows up in this movie, if you're not on board, you are just out. I was out on that. Men are obsessed with their penises, so I mean, this guy, this Ari Aster made a movie about his penis, basically, so. <laughs> Please leave that in. <laughs> I will. And that's it for a review of Bo is Afraid, which is now in theaters. Please let us know in the comments, what did you think of Bo is Afraid? And especially let us know if you disagreed with us, and we will see you next time.